Hello, welcome to my latest YouTube video and podcast. Today, I am really, really excited about having an old friend, colleague, and probably one of the brightest and most intuitive coaches and mental health practitioner that I know. Uh, Michelle Chalfant rocks, and probably most of you already know about her. Mm -hmm. And instead of me messing up and trying to remember her biography, Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Hi, Ross. It's so wonderful to be with you again. I know we've known each other for years now, and I love always when we are able to get on and do a podcast together. So thank you for having me on today. Goodness. Well, um, gosh, I've been a licensed therapist for probably 20 years. I've, I'm also a coach. Um, I have had a podcast. It's called The Adult Chair. Yeah. Or I can't even believe I'm saying this. It'll be 10 years. Um, and I have to say it is an incredible podcast and I am chasing it because it is ranked really highly. And if I, I can just be in you. your shadow, I'll be happy. Thank you. <laughs> That's so kind. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Most people tell me it's like getting free therapy. <laughs> I go, thank you yeah. for the adult chair. I'm getting free therapy on your podcast. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I've had a podcast since November of 2024, and um, I, I do a lot of things. I do live events. Um, I developed a model called The Adult Chair. Yeah. Really what The Adult Chair is all about is I help people remember who they truly are under the false self, under the masks, under the codependency, under who we think we are really is not who we are. So I help them dig down and crack themselves open to figure out who they are and touch and then live from that true self perspective. So I do that through live events. Um, I have a new membership coming out this spring. Um, gosh, online courses. Um, I developed an adult chair coaching certification program. I do a lot of things, Ross. I'm a busy girl, but yes, I love are. all of it. Much like you, I'm really passionate about helping people um, transform their lives. So yeah, so that's who I am. And mm -hmm. I love talking about all this with you. So thanks for having me on. Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we talked before recording, um, this conversation and we are always, our talks usually um, are scheduled for five or 10 minutes. They end up being like a half an hour. We ra <laughs> later realize we got to stop or we're not going to have time to do the podcast. But, um, yeah. This this conversation, we talked um, a little bit more about um, how your adult chair program parallels my my self love recovery treatment program. So yeah. I would love for you to to tell our listeners um, mm -hmm. if you can walk um, if there is a typical codependent or what I call someone with self love deficit disorder, how do they come to you and and how does um, your um, adult chair program mm -hmm. uh, manifest to the point that really gives them what they need, the healing and what I call self-love. Yeah. Actually, it's not my term self-love. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't claim it, but I do identify with it. Yeah, of course. Well, something that I think you and I both have in common is codependency. Like right. I know this well, and I think if you look it up online, you'll see a picture of you and me together. <laughs> We're yeah. the poster children for yeah. codependency. So I know this topic because I've lived it. And I realized many, many years ago, um, I go, what the heck is wrong with me? Why am I so drained all the time? Why am I so triggered? Why am I so worried about what other people think of me? And so in my own training, you know, as a therapist and of course, as a coach and working with clients, what I realized was, and I want to hear your opinion on this, of course, but um, to me, codependency is an addiction and it's addiction to other. What happens is we lose ourselves. We disconnect from self at a really young age and connect to another human as a young kid whether it be from abandonment or neglect or whatever it might be, we learn to become really almost like our energy or get fed energetically from another human. So we attach onto them and mm -hmm. we get all the energy from them. We know what they're feeling before they're feeling it. And we disconnect from ourselves. So, and then without other, it feels uncomfortable. We go through withdrawal, much like an addict, right? So for me, codependency is, and I remember one of the first podcasts I did, like probably in 20 or 2014 was, um, 
I'm okay if you're okay. Hmm. In other words, if you're not okay, then I am anxious, then I am uncomfortable, I'm depressed, I'm shaky, I'm, feel, you know, all of the things. So my work in the adult chair, what I do with my model is I do a lot with the inner child. I do a lot with parts work, honestly, and it's my own version of parts work. You know, I know that there's IFS out there, but- oh, wait, um, tell, tell our listeners what part, parts work is. Yeah, parts work is, um, when I think about a human being, I think about us being a collection of parts. So even if like, if you were to snap our photo right here on Zoom, right, or on YouTube, like right here, and then you took that picture and cracked it into 500 pieces, there are 500 parts. So we have all these kinds of parts that live within us. So it's judgment. We've got the codependent part. We've uh -huh. got the inner critic part. We've got the controller. So we are a, we are a collection of all of these different parts that make up our whole self. So what we want to do then when we're doing our own work to transform self and really to find our, our true identity is we look at the parts that are in the way or blocking or making up our false self identity. So I do something called parts work. And one of my favorite- fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah and I do it in a very spiritual way. I know that there's, you know, in, um, internal family systems is out there and it's similar to that, but the parts work I've been doing has been, gosh, over the course of over 20 years, um, there's a lot of energy language that's involved. It's a little different than what Dick Schwartz does, although I like his, people tell me mine's easier. Um, I do, and I consider the inner child to be a part. So a big part of what I do with people mm -hmm. is working with their inner child because that's the part of us right. that has this emptiness inside. You know, and when we do inner child work, we're learning to, again, feel our emotions versus me feeling your emotions. If I'm so attached to you and I need you to know who I am, we've got to disconnect that and learn how to step in our own self. So with the inner child work, we learn about our own true emotions. Can, can, I, can I say something really quick? Yeah, please, so, please. Um, there's actually, I'm trying to keep track of two things I want to talk about. But yeah. when you talk family, uh, um, internal family systems, um, about four years ago, someone goes, wow, um, I didn't know that you include internal family systems in your theoretical work. And I go, well, and I'm embarrassed to say this, actually probably six years ago. And I said, what is internal family systems? And then I quickly Googled it. And I thought, oh, geez, this thing's huge. And Dick Schwartz is, and then I remember right. going, oh yeah, I saw him at a training. Yeah. Just like 10 years ago, someone said, wow, you, your work is very close to um, incorporate self-psychology theory. I go, Actually, I remember studying it, so I had to say, what is that? Because I didn't want to embarrass myself. And so, <laughs> but I share that is that, you know, we um, trendsetters, I don't know, trendsetters, that's not the best, right term. We content, um, whatever. We, yeah. people who create uh, um, important information for people who need it. Um, yourself and me, we kind of created from our, um, organically from our own worldview, our own experience, our own recovery. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is a lot of us think alike and don't even know it. And so that that's that's what I try to tell people as much as possible is that my work, other people's work doesn't have to be separate. You can right. take a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So I just wanted to throw that in. Um, do you remember where I interrupted you at? It was no, but I no, but I do want to talk about that for a moment because I okay. agree with you. Um and what I'm realizing is I had, I've had the same experience. Cause I remember when I was, cause in my coaching program, I teach yeah. people how to do my version of parts work and time and time again, people would say, is this IFS? Is this like IFS? I'm like, what the heck is IFS? I don't even know what it is a few years ago. And then I Googled it and I'm like, it's kind of like you. And I'm like, isn't that fascinating? And what I realize is they were all tapping into a collective consciousness all, it's mm -hmm. like this giant cloud out there of information. And I'm realizing like we are tapping into this cloud. So I I was listening to Eckhart Tolle the other day. Oh my God. I was like, that guy, that guy is really, he just crazy. said this thing that I've been saying for five years. I'm like, and I never heard him say it. So I was yeah. like, where did that come from? And I realized again, like we all, every human, not just me and you, but everybody, we are tapping into this collective consciousness and it's out there. 
And all you got to do is go, well, gosh, you know, what makes sense right now? And then I'll start writing about it. And then what do you know? Someone else is doing something in a similar way. So I love that. Um, and, and I have, yeah. have an additional point of view. I look at it as there are truths. Yeah. And sometimes the truths go beyond humans' intellectual capability mm -hmm. to like recognize them and see them. It just takes the evolution of of, of our profession, of the contributions yeah. and the reformulation. And um, an example for me would be, uh, and I don't know how this happened, but the second year I was um, on my job where as a counselor, psychotherapist after grad school, 1990, 1990, I stumbled across, accidentally, I got into someone's disassociated memories and I didn't know what I was wow. doing. And that person became suicidal after the session. And I realized, holy yeah. leap, yeah. I'm playing with fire. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And then I started researching it. And then that has been a 30 year um, developmental process. And eventually it became my uh, my hitch method, or, but my healing the inner trauma child trauma mm. resolution integration method. And, and then people like, and by the way, I have to preface this, I am not at the same pay grade or intellectual level as Besser van der Kolk and Peter Levine. <laughs> Let me get that out of the way. <laughs> Let's just, me neither. <laughs> and then Besser van der Kolk came, came on the scene, I don't know, 20 years ago and Peter Levine and now, yeah. and all of these people are talking about trauma, trauma resolution, polyvagal theory. And I accidentally figured out a way to do what they do in a different way. Um, and, and part of it's a, a, a little bit of pride that I figured it out first. I just didn't have enough know-how to get it out there. So yes. we are all coming to understand similar things from our own point of view, our own world experience. And so we get a chance to call it the hitch method, the, the adult chair. Right, exactly. Thing. But, exactly. And But when we speak from our own point of view, our own worldview, it can be different because it fits mm -hmm. us. And the, and the most authentic and congruent way to do this is how we teach people. It has to come from who we are. So, exactly. so that to me is the fascination, how fascinating it is and how we all are connected, but yet individual. So connected. And I realized too, like some people, they, what we find is that then we resonate with different people's work. It's like, oh, that just feels right to me. Right. It's so easy. I'm going to, I'm going to practice this now. And then we go to the next thing. So it's a beautiful thing. I love it. So you had mentioned earlier um, how you see codependency as an addiction. That mm -hmm. was kind of one of my things that I, I I talked about early on. Would would you mind talking about a little bit about that? And I'd like to share yeah. with you how I see it and talk about you know yeah you know the withdrawal symptoms, mm -hmm. pathological loneliness, or this that, and the other. But yeah. what was your your um, intellectual template, your understanding of codependency as an addiction, and then it, and yeah. as such, how do you help your your clients overcome it? Yeah. Um, the addiction part comes in when it's like, I don't know who I am without you. Right. So I'm addicted to you. Yes. I'm addicted to your well being. I want to make sure that you're good. I want to make sure that everything that I'm doing benefits you. So, and if I'm not doing that, I don't know who I am. I've lost myself completely. So there is that element of an addiction. Yeah. Okay. And it's like we hyper focus on someone else. And then, because when that person removes themselves or goes away or gets upset with us, it creates this anxiety, overwhelm, no different than if you were to take, let's say an alcoholic and you take their, let's just say their beer away or their alcohol away, yeah, what happens? There's an anxiety, there's an overwhelm. We start shaking on the inside, all of the things. So there's really a withdrawal that we go through um, in the same way. So to me, I, you know, after seeing so many clients and working with myself, honestly, I was like, wow, it's so interesting. You know, when my husband's walking through the house um, and if he's off, emotionally off in any way, shape or form, and this right. is in the beginning of being married to him 20 years ago, um, if he were, let's say, to come home from work and he was in a bad, having a bad day, let's just say, mm -hmm. I would feel this like, oh, you know, like really get anxious about it. Or if someone didn't text me back within, you know, an hour, my brain goes, I must have done something wrong. You know, it's like all immediately. So 
what I had to learn how to do was sit with the uncomfortable feelings of what if he is off? You know, yeah. I don't know that it's about me. And what if I don't make up a story, but instead I turn back to self and reconnect to self? Because as codependents, we're so, our energy is always going out there. I've got to go out. I got to connect to you. I got to connect to you versus, so what I teach my people is like, bring it back home to you, redirect back to you. Because that little kid, I'm very visual. So I always see like my little inner child, when I did my own work around this, she was five years old and yeah. it, she just looked empty inside. Right. There was nobody home. And what would fill her up was, you know, connecting with my mother five times a day and then connect, making sure my husband was okay, making sure my kids are okay. Is my sister okay? Or my friend? It's like, holy moly. It's like all those puzzle pieces that should have been inside of me instead of inside of me where all the others, all the other people were inside of me. And like, that's not healthy. Right. So, yeah. I, I, I mean, gotcha. There's a saying um, that when if two guys feel like really similar, they go brother from a, a um, brother from a another mother, another mother. Well, you're a sister from an, a, a, a different another mister, mother, an, another <laughs> mister. It's got a rhyme. A sister. From, I love it. Yeah. A sister from another mister. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In other words, um, I asked you about, you know, this addiction thing and you explained it. And then you went on to all the other things that connect to it, which is yeah. kind of how my brain works. Yeah. But, so I made a comment earlier how our worldview and how we perceive the problems for which yeah. um, we've recovered ourselves, at least I have, and we help others, um, mm -hmm. matches up with our unique selves. And mm -hmm. so I, I am a, um, a 35, I've been a substance abuse and addictions um, um, specialist for my whole career. Yeah. And, and so my explanation of addiction is obviously you're going to see how it parallels. So... I see codependency um, from what I call a or self-love deficit disorder from a 3D perspective that it we hurt others when we try to fit it in one theory. So I don't yep. allow myself to have one theory. Mm -hmm. I include whatever makes sense from other people. Yep. And sometimes I recognize it and I give them credit. And other times I find out, oh, geez, <laughs> I, I need to start giving them credit. And so codependency is caused by, at the most fundamental explanation, by attachment trauma. And that is mm -hmm. the horrible neglect, abuse, deprivation that a child mm -hmm. goes through during his or her most critical points of development. Mm -hmm. And that attachment trauma, like PTSD trauma, is taken offline and put into a different part of our brain, which we don't have access to. Yeah. So, so and true. So the the child who has attachment trauma experienced incredible skull, uh, soul scorching loneliness mm -hmm. and shame. And that's all kind of cordoned off to another part of the brain. So codependency is an addiction and that is um, motivated to overcome the withdrawal symptom. And the number one withdrawal symptom of codependency or SLDD is pathological loneliness. Yep. That feeling is a bone aching existential nightmare where you yep. do not feel alive or comfortable or safe in your body, in your life, unless you're in a relationship. So SLDD addiction is not an addiction to a narcissist. Mm -hmm. It's an addiction because that makes no sense. Why does someone want, it's like, it's like um, if you hate wine, you, you're not going to be, and you're an alcoholic, you're not going to pick wine. You're going to pick the drink you like. Right, exactly. And so the addiction really is to relationship because if you're in a relationship, the, that pathological loneliness doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And so the withdrawal symptom of, of um, a codependent leaving their drug of choice, which is a relationship, is mm -hmm. pathological loneliness. Yeah. And that pain they don't know every codependent, every SLD I know explains the same thing mm -hmm. with this pathological loneliness concept. And that pain is so severe that they will do things that they regret have consequences, just like a regular addiction in mm -hmm. order to make the pain go away. And, and they suffer, their kids suffer. And so, and the only way to solve that, which makes it even more complicated is you have to figure out a way to tap into the disassociated trauma and, and I'm going way past what I wanted to say. So yeah. I, I also see um, SLDD or codependency as an addiction. Mm -hmm. And that the only way to solve it 
is to look at it as an addiction and find out how to recover. So yeah. you, I loved hearing your point of view because it seems really solidly um, connected to mental health theory, yeah. practical understanding of the problem. Yeah. And I would imagine your folks um, do well with that. Yeah, they really do. Um, I have a, a, it's a free inner child course where I start everybody. It's at the adultchair.com forward slash inner child. Mm -hmm. It's two guided meditations that I created specifically to number one is to connect with the inner child. And then the second one mm -hmm. is to help clear negative limiting beliefs and yeah. codependency. It's like, it's two great meditations and with, with um, journaling prompts that take people really on this journey of reconnecting to the self. And even with the addicts that I've worked with over the years, um, in fact, I was just working with a girl the other day, I'm doing a relationship course right now. And she had broken up with her boyfriend and you know, back and forth. And I said, you need six months away. Right. Just stop, just stop it. Well, you know, I'm like, no, 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 no. Here's your homework six months away from him. And then number two, you've got to learn how to sit with yourself. You've got to learn how to feel what's on the inside and it's going to be effing painful. Yeah. And it's so much loneliness, that loneliness. Oh my God. It, it, I agree with you. It's like so incredibly painful, but here's what I've learned in my own journey of feeling my own pain and working yeah. with countless clients is as you well know, you've got to go through the pain and then you come out the other side and it's like, we feel liberated. We feel empowered. Right. We feel strong. We feel clear. It's like, holy crap, I did it. Right. And something starts to change every time we sit with ourselves and humans, I find are not good with that. We want a quick fix. It's like, I don't feel good. I'm going to go, you know, get a glass of wine. I'm going to go do drugs. I'm going to go find another human. I'm going to binge out on Netflix. We, we don't know because we're not taught how to feel our emotions. We've got to learn how to reconnect with the body and feel what's going on on the inside. So I want to, I want um, to say, um, make, make a comment on something you said just a few minutes ago about the loneliness, pathological loneliness. Yeah. Um, my, my, my experience, um, myself and my clients is there is a high mm -hmm. relapse rate yeah. When they, um, I got this saying from um, AA, when you write white knuckle it, or you just do it out of pure willpower, um, yeah. because the loneliness, as I said before, comes from another source. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is where I introduce, um, I introduce um, kind of like an addictions type of psychotherapy yeah. counseling, help people yeah, yeah. through it, you know, like a convivial partner one day at a time, mm -hmm. you know, knowing you're powerless over this. And, and, and I'm not a big fan these days of the 12-step programs, but this is when I utilize it. But yeah. there's something else you said, and that is um, um, I tell people, and I said, if, if you ever quit smoking or if you know anyone or seen a movie of an heroin addict or an alcoholic, they lock them in the door they, and they're begging, please, please, please. Yeah. This, you're going to go through a version of this. And yeah. and, and I, I don't tell them this, but the probability of relapse is really high. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I, try, I don't want to encourage that, but you're going to go through pain and it's going to last. Um, the withdrawal symptom, just like alcohol is, um, I think it's like seven days, cocaine is 10 days. Every drug has its yeah. pattern of detoxing. It's going to be between one week and six mm -hmm. weeks. And yeah. it's going to bleep and suck and yep. you're going to and, and that's when the focus is on that, as you do, just, you know, and so we, we are dealing with people that are naked without internal yeah. defense mechanisms or knowing how to deal with their life without their drug of choice. And, yeah. and, and I love what you do because you, you take your own concepts, your own theories, your own, uh, your own uh, techniques mm -hmm. and you apply it. And you get to the same place that I do. And, that, and I yes. think that, that's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I agree with you, like on, on everything that you just said about that. And, and like, like I was saying, though, we just we don't know how to do that. Well, we don't know how to feel our emotions. Well, I mean, if I had a dollar <laughs> for all the clients I saw over all the years, and I'd say, well, how does that make you feel? Where do you feel that in your body? And they go, what do you mean? What do you <laughs> 
what do you mean? I'm like, where do you feel that in your, do you feel it in your body? No. So, so much of what I did with clients over all the years was somatic work. Really. It's like, okay, let's do a body scan. Where do you feel that teeny tiny little something going on? Oh yeah, there is something there. Okay. So, but. um, So, so you are, you um, are basically um, saying what the, the greats of our field say that our Bessel van der Kort, what's the name of his book? The body. The body keeps the score. Yeah. Score, score. Um, the way, and, and I'm not going to go into how hitch works because that's a whole nother conversation, but my hitch method, the healing inner trauma child, it starts with yeah. me talking about something that's very painful yeah. and then looking at their face and noticing affect bubble up. And then I yeah. ask, where do you feel it in your body? And from that point, yeah, I can go really far into their, their psyche. And so it starts with the body. Yep. And you're, we are, we are really lucky um, that the, the field figured that out because you can't get to it in your mind. Oh my God. I mean, this is, and this is why I created the coaching program that I have because, and I can say this to you because I'm still a licensed therapist, even though I don't practice one-on-one anymore. There are more therapists out there that stink than are great. Sorry. Actually, <laughs> I'd rather you say it so you you don't catch flack. I'm saying it. I'm okay, saying well, it. And it's not that people don't have good intentions, but I have heard over the years. Yeah. And 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 here it is. It's not that people aren't going into our field with great intentions they want to heal. Unfortunately, I don't think our training has been great. You've got to be willing to go outside of just getting a basic, you know, MSW or a master's in counseling. It's like there's so much more. I did a training in SE. I've done somatic work, but and and that's part one. It's going outside of what we get in our master's degree. Number two, you've got to do your personal work. That's the key, Ross. Okay, from from for for my podcast people, I just pointed at her and I smiled with a, a big grin. And yeah. I have a big smile too. I love I'm a therapist. I have tons of therapist friends. And and we all we talk about it. And I don't sit here and throw any therapist under the bus. Again, if you go into this field, you have great intentions. I've heard from more people that say they don't do their personal work. You can only take your client as far as you've gone. You and, cannot go into this field unless you've done your own work. And what I say is you can't see in others what you are oblivious to or blind in yourself. Exactly. And most codependents, and I stand by this, um, excuse me, most psychotherapists, it actually actually kind of works out the same. Most psychotherapists <laughs> right? start their career yeah. as codependents. And, yeah. um, uh, oh gosh, it's a... Now, this is how I know I'm 62. It's like, I I don't remember things as quickly. Um, Alice Miller's book, um, The Drama of Get the Child, which profoundly shaped my my understanding of things, she talks about this, but she never uses the word codependence. But a a person who is to become a psychotherapist has this need to heal others, but they don't know how to heal themselves. And the good psychotherapist or I would say the effective psychotherapist, they do their own work. You've got to do your work. Doing their own work. And so if you are, if you have a therapist who was an alcoholic mm-hmm. or a therapist who was a child, an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse, um, and you're going there and they've never dealt with it and you're going there for therapy, it doesn't matter how many books they read. They can't no. get past, they can't get past what they haven't got past in their own life. Yeah, and, and since SLDD or codependency runs rampantly in the helping professions, coaches, psychotherapists, yeah. nurses, yeah, um, it's virtually impossible for them to help another if they don't know what they have. Then throw in the world yeah. doesn't know anything about codependency, which, right. um, and I don't want to really move in this direction, but um, I'm just. Uh, completed um, a book called The Codependency Revolution that's going to be mm-hmm. published hopefully in two or three months. That's where I finally set the record straight. So I, I like what you say. Yeah. Is that that, um, that I, I don't know. I don't know if I like it. 
I mean, part well, of me wants to be defending it because I'm a therapist, but it's no, true. No, no, no. But, but I, and us, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to, that's just a fact. I, mean, I, after I agree talking, with it. I agree. To talk, I've talked to client after client. After, I mean, I, I don't even know how many clients I've seen over 20 years. Everyone like, that wow. you get and I get tell us the same story. They say the same, same darn story. thing. Same thing. Like, wow, like this is so different than anything I've ever had in sessions. Yeah. Normally I just go into therapy and I sit and talk and I don't get anything out of it. I'm like, okay. So I'm not sitting here to judge therapies, a therapist. No, I, I I'm really, that's it. not what I'm doing by any means, but I am encouraging it's, anyone that is listening to this, it's a therapist, please, please, please do your work because I, we need more therapists out there and coaches uh -huh. to do their work because people need help on this planet. There's a lot of unnecessary suffering. So we need you to do your work. We need Absolutely. you to do your work. So what you're, what you're doing is a public it's service. A fact. It's just a fact. I mean, and it's unfortunate. I, I again, <laughs> I could list probably a hundred people off the top of my head right now that have said like, what is going on? You know, anyway, I don't want to go off on that tangent, but, but yeah, but what I want to say before, <clears throat> we sh before we shift is um, in my intake, in my first session, I always ask them their experiences with, with past psychotherapists. Um, and every one say, oh, I had some bad ones and some good ones. And when they talk about the good ones, what they're yeah. talking about people who are exceptional listeners, exceptionally empathetic, uh, ex exceptional in giving advice, mm -hmm. but not for solving the problem for which they, they, they've they been hired. So we're on the same page and hopefully other therapists yeah. uh, are hearing this or clients are hearing this and they can you know, as they say, buyer beware, that they don't yeah. get caught uh, in some form of complacency and end up with someone that could only lead them a third of the way that they need to go. You know, the goal of working with someone, in my personal opinion, this is the way that I've worked. This is what I train right. my coaches. You've, you, we got to go after the root issue. Yes. Because you, you can't help someone transform their lives or heal Con just consciously, like what I call above the chin, you've got to go chin down. <laughs> I love that. Right? Chin, it's like the yeah. you, it's like the iceberg, you know, the conscious mind. I can sit and tell you all day long about my issues, right? Yeah. But where does the deep healing occur? The deep transformation is chin down. It's in the body. It's yeah. freaking painful. It's hard work to go down there and go chin down, right? It's in the heart. It's in the body. It's in the, it's in the solar plexus, all the things. So actually, that's the way I have to go. And I just want to say one more thing about people that have therapists. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Hold on. I just want to just make a connection to where you're at. So so you go in the body. I make one more connection. I go into the amygdala, which is yes. the part of the brain that the trauma is stored that we don't know about that yeah. the body is able to feel. So yes. So what you do and what I do is we are we are actually accessing a part of their memory systems that has been shut down that the body connects us to. That's what Absolutely. I'm Part of the, the um, when I work with groups and in my courses, like the inner child work that I do with people is like, is, I call it reparent or reparenting the child. So yeah. again, I've been doing this for years and also I'm like, oh, I that sounds like such and such, kind of like we were talking about earlier, but like I will go back in time. It's like we bounce. I don't spend a lot of time in the past, but I'll go back in time, find that little kid, that had that trauma, reparent that little kid, and then we bounce back into the present moment. And they're like, wow, I feel so different. What's going on now? I'm like, yeah, we just did some really cool quantum um, quantum parts work. So that's your but term I would, or is, is that a term? That's it's a there. term that I use in my coaching program, but yeah. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, because it's quantum healing. Like we're going into like almost like another dimension. We're yeah. going back, I'm healing. We're doing the work back there. We're transforming yep. that child. It is profound work. I've worked with people. I remember this girl, she was a latchkey kid. Right. And she said, you know, you know, my father died. Um, it was, again, it was abandonment, but not, um, it was more like covert abandonment. Like it, yeah. it, her mother didn't mean to, I mean, it wasn't like her Oblivious. mother was a drug addict and she left, right? The yeah. father was in the hospital for years when the, when the girl was growing up, when she was a little girl and the mother spent a lot of time at the hospital with a dad who was dying. So the grandmother and the neighbor would watch her. Anyway, the father ended up passing away when the little girl was like six. And then the grandmother started just staying there and she wasn't the most loving grandparent, um, but she would come when the little girl came home from school. So she didn't have a great childhood, a lot of abandonment and, and, you know, just didn't feel emotionally connected to her mom or her dad. Then she was anyway, 
But we went back and I, I remember saying to her, okay, let's just go back in time. And we like reworked this whole scene. I said, I want you to walk into the house. Again, I'm summarizing it way down, but walk into the house. What do you mm -hmm. wish had happened instead? And she told this whole story and I do some NLP and some fun stuff that's in there. And then she- Neuro linguistic programming for our non- Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. You but, would do the uh, same thing if I was talking. I know yes, you. I would. You're right. You're right. And um, and we went back. I can still see this client. Gosh, it had to be like 15 years ago. And um, and she came out of it. And I said, okay, I want you to go back in time now. When you think about when you were six years old, you walk in from school. What comes up now? And she was like, well, this is so weird. I have no anxiety. Like it was gone. All of her angst, her anxiety, her sadness. It was gone. And I, and I said what do you feel now? She goes, I have so much peace at what just happened. I'm like, that's called quantum parts work. Like we are going back. We're doing this quantum healing in another dimension. And, and even though you're sitting here with me right now, we're going into your child. We're reparenting that little girl and then bringing you into present. Oh my God, Ross, her whole life changed. I, I am. I'm getting goosebumps. And it was so cool. So I, I have to say this, uh, um, there's, there's, there's many ways to skin a cat. And by the way, that's a horrible saying. There's many ways to do the same thing. And you're doing, we're having the same result. Mm -hmm. So you're quantum, you call quantum. I don't because, you know, my intellectual fast, my fascination with the brain and processes, my, that all that stuff. I actually, or what I do, I have an explanation so we're actually tapping into the disassociated memories that the, yep. the brain is like a machine. If it, if there is trauma, say regular PTSD, and say someone that just saw a bunch of people murdered or someone, God forbid, got raped, and the brain makes the decision that's too much trauma to remember, we have to sequester it into another part of the brain. Um, but what the brain doesn't do, or it's a flaw in evolution, right. is the feelings and the emotions leak through. So someone who has the PTSD suffers egregiously and they they don't know where it's coming from. They just know they drink, they yell, they have problems. Yeah. So your quantum method, in my opinion, and I could be wrong because I do not want to tell tell you or guess what your, your, it is, but I'm just gonna just, I'll guess, is you are tapping into the same place that, you know, Bessel van der Kark does, Peter Levine does, I do, polyvagal um, trauma therapists do, is we are finding the memory mm -hmm. in the part of the brain that is not meant to remember, and we're getting it through the body. Yeah. And so your quantum method, whatever you call it, is, is having the same impact. And so yesterday, mm -hmm. this one woman... Um, I, wa I walked her through my hitch method and, and, and the next set time I met her, she goes, what did you do? I have no anxiety, fear. I'm not lonely. She goes, I want, and she, and she joked, who can I make a donation to? It was, she was so excited because in that one session, everything changed. Yeah. Now it did surprise me because that's, I, what I do, well, you're doing the same thing. And doesn't that feel grand? Isn't that oh, a yeah. wonderful experience to be a part of that? Oh, I yeah. feel like it's a gift. We get paid and we get to oh, my God. something spe special. It brings me so much joy to have, to see someone experience such relief and end their suffering. That's, that's what brings me the most joy. Yeah. It yeah. really does. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I love it. Your work is second to none. And, and we have done I'm going to guess this is our fourth podcast and, uh, or, uh, or YouTube interview or however it started. It's like talking to an old friend that I've known yeah. my whole life. It's like, <laughs> it's like someone understands me. <laughs> yes. You're speaking my language. Yeah, yes. totally. Cause I oh, yeah, people are like, damn the chemistry. I'm like, I know we have a lot of fun when we talk for sure. Cause I'm writing a book as well and it'll be out next year. And something I'm putting in this book is the power of the adult chair in really transforming your life. So I go through, you know, what I consider like the five main issues that most yeah. humans have, which would be anxiety, depression, codependency, um, any sort of relationship issue. And then the last one, which I absolutely love is are working with triggers. Triggers are like, you can put that in any category, like who right. isn't triggered, right? 
And I want to let people know when you have the right tools, it's easy. Now, right. the tools are easy. Now, going through it might not be, right? But the tool, when you have the right tools, so keep searching, like whether you come to the adultchair.com, go to your website, go find your stuff, keep searching and find what resonates with you because there's absolutely, there's so many people doing incredible work out in the world. Mm -hmm. Keep searching, but do keep doing your work because and if you're with someone and it doesn't feel right, I remember having so many people say, I've, I've been working with this person for 10 years, you know, it doesn't feel right anymore. I'm like, you're not disappointing <laughs> your person when you switch therapists or coaches or whomever you're with. So just and, and, that, and that's going. A, an SLD process. It totally is. And, yeah. and by the way, the, the therapist, some, there are some therapists that are narcissistic. Um, and, and no, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, don't be so surprised. <laughs> <It's shocked. laughs> but, and codependent, like right here, I'm raising my hand who can't see me, but thank God I worked on that many years well, ago. Well, we and it's were, not like you end it, by the way, I want people to know you raise your awareness around it and it does get better and better and better and you're less and less. But yes. I want people to know you don't cross that finish line. Like I will never be codependent again. It's like, I now I, now I have an awareness of it. So I see it when it pops up. And I, and I, I changed everything by my frame of reference. I call it self-love deficit disorder. And when, and I, and I have my, um, my SLDD or codependency pyramid that says at the bottom, it's caused by attachment trauma from that creates core shame from yeah. that pathological loneliness from that is the addiction. And on top of, on top of the, the pyramid is everything we know about codependency. Yeah. And so, so what I say is once we resolve the causes of mm -hmm. the, the attachment trauma, the core shame, the loneliness, the addiction, um, it trans, it, it transitions into self-love abundance. And yeah. that's what I call, it's a cure. You can't go back because there's no reason to be anything other than self-loving now or self-love abundant. And yeah. so you still, and so I believe, and, and I might be wrong, but I believe what you're saying is you still can be a caretaker. You still could want yes. you have tons of empathy. You still can volunteer. You still might make a mistake and help too much. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use codependency because that pathologizes what is healthy. Exactly. But, and so you're right that we don't lose that that empathetic um, sacrificing, wanting to care part of ourselves. It's just no longer pathological. Exactly. I mean, what I have said to my people over the years is like, when you feel yourself disconnect from you, that's when the red flag goes up yes. and it's okay. And it's okay. And I will say to my children, I will say to my friends and family, like, Hey, I'm a, this is, this is the thing. You've got to have awareness around what you're doing versus right. unconsciously doing it. You've got to become conscious. And when we live in our adult chair, it's the healthiest version of our adult self, right? So that comes with consciousness, raise awareness. You're living in the moment. You're able to feel your emotions, all the things in the adult chairs. I hate, I don't like labels. I don't even like the label of codependency. It gets yeah. a frame of reference and then I let it go. I hate, that's I hate why labels. I got rid of it. Self-love abundance disorder that can be cured and turned into self-love. Absolutely. Because that, if you have labels, like people go, hi, I'm anxious or hi, I'm depressed. It's like, it's yeah. like, they've got like a, a sign on their forehead. Yeah. I'm like, no, you're, that's not who you are. That's, that's something you you're are. experiencing yeah. for right yeah. now. And it's temporary. And with the right tools, it can be in your life less and less and less. So let's just work on that. But please don't call yourself. I am this, right? You're a human. That's who you are. So but on the on a side note, um, knowing that I had the tendencies of this thing called codependency, yeah, and I've worked on it so long, just to, just to give your people just some advice, like I had people that in my life I could say to them, "Hey, this is what I want to do. I want to call my son who's in college and you know let him know X, Y, and Z. Is that codependency or caring? So yeah. you need that you need that healthy person to go, yeah, that's caring. Let's go ahead yeah. and do it. Okay, great. So. I, I give, I've given like three or four I, people in my I, life I love, permission to say, yeah. Hey, hold on. That's a codependency path. I'm like, okay, cool. Thank you. And I'm not offended anymore. I'm like, okay, great. Thank right. you. Perfect. I, I love that. So say that one more time, because I think it's that important. When I, oh, wait, wait, I've got another one too. When it comes to this codependency, here's how you know. And I, by the way, on the adult share podcast, I think I've done 23 podcasts on codependency. That's how much I love it. 24. I have done 
I, and you're, you're like three or four of them. Right. But, yeah. um, so if you go to my adult chair website, the adult chair.com, you can put in the search bar, like your name and yeah. all of our shows will pop up. You can put in oh, wow. codependency and 24 will pop up, but here's the way that, you know, if you're being codependency or caring, here's a key, key element to this. If I, let's just say, I say, Hey Ross, I know that you're going to the airport next week. I'm going to come and pick you up. I will drive to the airport. No problem. I'll be at your house at 6 a.m. I've got you and I can watch your animals, your cats and your dogs at home. No problem. And if you say to me, thanks so much. I don't, I don't need that. I'm all set. Caring, a caring person would go, okay, great. Codependency would be like, are you mad at me? Why right. do you want not want me to drive you to the airport? So if I'm thinking about what you just said back to me, mm -hmm. And it was a very healthy response. If you said, no, thanks, I'm all set. If that's all you said to me, if I'm triggered, that's my stuff. Right. That's that's that codependency kind of bubbling up like, uh-oh, I need Ross to let me drive him to the airport and take care of his cats and dogs right. because then I'm going to feel filled up. That's an indicator. And for me, that was gold. When right. I was really doing a lot of my own work around this, I'm like, how do, the, how do you freaking know? Because I think I'm just being really caring and loving to everybody. And so no- and, and what you're saying uh, from a psychodynamic point of view is um, codependents, SLDs, um, they learn early in their life and all the way into adulthood that helping people secures them safety. It yep. keeps them from um, being hurt, abandoned, neglected, or abused. So Alone. Talk uh, about loneliness. Or alone or lonely. Actually. Yeah. And, yeah. And so when they can't help, they're nervous that something bad's going to happen. And they don't really remember it. It's, it's part the, the, they remember the part that you say. Well, sister from a different mister, what is the origins of the beginnings of this whole self chair? Um, what, what adult chair? Adult the adult chair. chair. The I'm, adult I'm chair. confusing my word terms and your yeah, terms. You're combining it. <laughs> <laughs> the self love chair. How did you come to it? I've had a lot of different trainings over the years and teachers and mentors. And I did a lot of inner child work, um, like 20 some years ago. Yeah. And then I had a mentor that was using, I've had a few mentors that used a lot of chair work, you know, yeah. which is of course, gestalt therapy and TA and all the things I had. A, uh, one of my teachers was using chairs, like the child, adolescent, adult, parentified child, you know, all the bunch of the chairs. And I really liked these three chairs that she used. So I plucked those three chairs yeah. and then I, and then I started using it with clients. So then I added everything I'd learned over 20 some years and I kept adding it into this thing and this model that I just kept kind of building called the adult chair. Um, and it keeps growing, honestly, like I have these five pillars that we all need to be a healthy adult. That's going to be in the book next year. So I just find it it keeps growing and morphing, you know, and the more yeah. that I keep practicing with people and learning on my own, but yeah. yeah. And again, I mean, I had so many people that, um, that came to me from, because of the podcast, people would say, I want to work with you all the way around the world. And I was like, I can't yeah. work with you. So that's why I created the coaching program because yeah. I kept hearing it in a, in a morning meditation in 2018, like teach people to do what you do. I'm like, I can teach people how to do this work with others. So that's why I created the coaching program. And yeah, um, that, that really yeah. And, and I do a lot of, again, the live events. I travel all over the United States. I'm supposed to be in the UK and Australia next year as well. And the book and maybe we're going to bump into each other with our new books out, Ross, next year. You never know. That's what I hope. I hope yeah. We Actually, we, we got to do not... this. We need to do this in person. That's what needs to happen. Okay, An in-person uh... podcast. I'm going to do the adult chair road show. And I'm going to oh. bounce all around the com the country this year. So maybe I'll bounce down to where you live and we'll do something like this live. That would be so fun. I want to bounce around and do one day events all around the country is what I plan to do starting this spring. So maybe I'll be bouncing down to where you are. Well, you and we'll do it in person. You keep bouncing. I'll be bouncing. <laughs> well, time to bounce out. Um, is that what the, the young people say? I'm usually like 20 years. We're gonna, I know. Me too, Ross. Yeah, please. Yeah. It's time to bounce. <laughs> kind of balance, yeah. Tell our listeners um, mm -hmm. how to get a hold of you and yeah. how to peruse your wonderful educational, inspirational services, products, Thank whatever you. you do. You can find everything out about me at theadultchair.com, theadultchair.com. Mm -hmm. I'm also on YouTube with you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I have a YouTube channel, but I'm on Instagram. Um, 
And again, if anyone is interested in the free inner child offering, it's a, it's a free inner child resource. That's right. the adultchair.com forward slash inner child. Um, the podcast is called The Adult Chair. My coaching program is called The Adult Chair. So again, everything is on the website, but it's also on Apple and, you know, we're all where you can hear all the things.